happened thanks to the the philanthropic philanthropic support of an incredible uh, gift, the biggest in our our 179 year, year history. We've embarked on a strategic planning uh, process. We've engaged with a uh, market assessment firm to to really look at what it is that we can do to and with our, our uh, campus at Caledonia Senior Living to serve the future needs of seniors and it's a fascinating uh, invigorating and energetic process that we're, we're involved with. Um, the residents and staff are all well, uh, we had a little bit of Covid in the building but unlike uh, previously when uh, we were all petrified of, of COVID and terrified of what it might mean for communities like ours. Um, everybody's vaccinated. We have all the tools and technologies and the, the headline I'd like you to, to know about is that no resident uh, really suffered anything more than a runny nose and a little tickly throat. Uh, everybody's out of isolation and we're, we're no longer in uh, what the Illinois Department of Public Health calls outbreak mode. So we're, we're, we're doing great at Caledonia. Uh, on the other side of the coin is the, the Scottish society. We have uh, culture, care on one side, culture on the other. And we, we've, I think this is perhaps the first time that we've met since uh, our Highland Games. Um, we're certainly the, 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 the first time we've met since we, we know that the financial uh, result of our Highland Games was a good one this year. We, for many, many years, we've we've lost uh, quite a lot of money on our Highland Games, but our commitment to put on a good show remained, and therefore uh, we were all um, willing to to sustain a loss. But this year, uh, the team of volunteers and staff and, and vendors who helped us with the Highland Games uh, helped us get to a point where the bottom line number was a black and not a red one. So we were thrilled with that. Uh, biggest pipe band championship in North America, uh, we were, were were thrilled with the result and the experience of our Highland Games in the new location at the DuPage County Fairgrounds. Uh, and finally, I want to say how much I'm looking forward to hearing Sarah's remarks. Um, Scottish food is uh, something that I uh, enjoyed growing up, of course, but uh, whenever I go back to Scotland, I try to take a different, uh, different journey and, and try some new restaurants. Um, I have on, on my desktop um, a, a document which has been living and growing for 20 years, uh, 30 years actually, um, and I send it to people who I know that are going to Scotland, and it is a list of their favourite foods and favourite restaurants, and I ask them to, to agree that if I send it to them, they will put something on it that is not currently on it. So in other words, it grows with every person's visit. And uh, it's a list of incredible food from, from Scotland. So I am really, really looking forward to hearing Sarah today. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end. I'll go back on to mute and, and say welcome to everyone. Gus, thank you. Your words are always inspiring. And you, you didn't, you mentioned our current good record with COVID, but Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care sailed through the original pandemic with zero deaths and just flying colors. And it was such an amazing record for a senior campus that, jo that Gus was given the OBE status by the queen at the time. So we're very proud of Gus. We're very proud of Caledonia. And congratulations on the successful festival, Gus. So we're going to get started. I just have one more we announcement before we do. Just a reminder that next month on September 14th, we're going to have Dr. Michael Brown, who is professor and chair of Irish, Scottish, and Enlightenment history at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland with us. And Dr. Brown plans to speak to us on failing to make peace, Adam Ferguson, the Carlisle Commission, and the Scottish Enlightenment in America. So I do hope you'll all make yourselves available. This is, this is promising to be a very interesting discussion. And so now, without further ado, we are so very pleased, and this is going to be so fun, Dr. McCausland-Jenick, 
who is from the department, she's the department chair of history and interdisciplinary studies at Indian Creek School in Maryland. And Dr. Janik is here with us to speak on the subject of the history, nature, and relevance of Scottish foods. So welcome. Um, thank well you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, Scottish food is near and dear to my heart. I, I um, like many of you, I grew up in Scottish American life. Um, my grandfather was the past president of the St. Andrews Society of Baltimore, founding member of the, or found, yeah, founding member of the Robert Burns Society of Annapolis. You went mute. mute. Sarah, you're muted. Oh, I think that, Connie, when you me muted, did you mute me too? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, I'll start over. It's lovely to see everyone. Um, I am very excited to be here. Uh, Scottish associations and Scottish American associations are things that are near and dear to my heart in many ways. I am... Um, the granddaughter of a past president of the St. Andrews Society of Baltimore. Um, I He was also the founding member of the Robert Burns Society of Annapolis and the Clan Buchanan Society in, in America, um, which is very exciting. Um, he was past president of this, the Clan Buchanan Society. Um, I grew up as a competitive Highland dancer going all over the place. I definitely competed at many a games, including um, in North Carolina through the Eastern Seaboard. So for those of you that have been to Grandfather Mountain, I've certainly competed there. And I did my PhD um, at the University of Edinburgh, actually on Scottish associational culture and Scottish associational culture in America, including St. Andrews societies. So this concept of Scottish American-ness and Scottish history and sharing Scottish history with people who associate with that identity is, is absolutely amazing. And I'm really, really grateful for being invited to speak. Um, since moving on from my PhD, I have, um, I have really found a love of, of food history and particularly Scottish food history. I am a social historian. I love to learn not necessarily um, about political or wars, which many people love. I love those too, but I love to think about how people dressed and how people behaved and how people saw themselves and their identity. And I don't think you can think of identity and, and life without fundamentally thinking about food, the thing that sustains us, the thing that makes us be able to be in this world. And food is far much more than something of sustenance, but it's something that is culturally alive as well. And so, this is, this is what today's um, paper is on. Now, I am first and foremost, a teacher. That's what I do for a living. And so for me, uh, you need to know what questions I'm hoping to answer with this paper today. Um, and really what I'm looking at is three different things. I'm doing this in order for you to get kind of an overview of what Scottish food has been throughout history and how it's really changed over time and why. So our three questions that I want to answer today is, how has Scottish cuisine developed over time? So how has it changed over time? What has influenced the development of this cuisine? And how has Scottish food culture been influenced by Scotland's history and concept of itself and national identity? As many of you know, Scotland's understanding of itself and the Scots' understanding of their place within Britain, the empire, the wider world has shifted throughout its history pretty dramatically. And probably unsurprisingly, the way that they use food as a cultural signifier has also changed over time to match that, that concept of, of national identity. And so those are the kind of the three things I want to do. And in order to achieve that, my goal is to kind of give you an overview from hunter-gatherer period to the modern period in order to see this shift over time. Now, in order to do that, it means that I can't go into a lot of specific detail um, particularly on ingredients and things like that. But um, maybe we can look at that a little bit more in the question time afterwards. Um, great, so let's get started. Now, I'm sure that many of you have heard this. Um, many uh, Burns dinner is started with the Selkirk grace, but some hay meat and can I eat and some what eat that want it, but we hay meat and we can eat. So say the Lord be thank it. And this is a really wonderful way, I think, of starting off this concept of 
we have food, we have the ability to, to continue on, which was so important for so many people, particularly throughout, throughout history. All right. Now, to start, I think we need to think about the stereotypes of Scotland's food. Now, many of us as Scottish Americans are very proud to be Scottish, be very proud of the food, but you know, Scotland has some stereotypes. Um, and when people think about Scotland's food, they often think of something that's bland, right? Scotland is not necessarily known globally for their, their cuisine, although that is obviously an incorrect stereotype. Oftentimes they think of haggis and most people, when you say, I'm going to try a haggis, although it's one of the most delicious foods, um, will think that that's not something they want to uh, consider. No vegetables, deeply unhealthy. The concept of the deep fried Mars bar or the deep fried anything comes to mind. But I want to point out that that is simply not the case, that Scotland has a purely natural larder, that there are foods that are just absolutely wonderful that are part of Scotland's natural um place in the world, particularly as an island nation. And I, I love this image because it demonstrates the types of foods and things that have come out of Scotland. All right, so well, let's start at the beginning. Let's start very early um, with the early hunter-gatherer societies. Now, these hunter-gatherer societies, we can trace back to about 7,000 BCE. So we see that people are living in Scotland around that time. Um, and obviously these people had to eat. Now, the hunter-gatherer societies of Scotland were actually very, very well fed. There's a diverse amount of foods that were available. They fish in the rivers and streams. We can see um, examples of fish, scallops, shellfish. They hunted in the mountains and moorlands. We know that seal was consumed as well as deer. Um, a lot of this is going to come from middens, which are literally mounds of trash. A Neolithic middens demonstrates that Scots were gathering things like fruits and nuts and berries. Um, while we don't have a ton of evidence of it, we're sure that people would, would eat the nettles and the, the, the various um, foodstuffs that they could gather around Scotland. Early settlements also, as soon as agriculture became a thing, we can see that there was cattle, there was sheep, there were pigs that were caught, that were kept alongside um, very early uh, agricultural products such as oats and barley. And unlike many other people in this period, Scotland had a hugely diverse diet in the hunter-gatherer period. In fact, Many people in Scotland were far more lucky than their counterparts in other places within Europe that they had all of this wonderful food that they were able to, to gather and eat. And we actually see that many of them from the, um, the records we have from bones and middens and things like that actually had a fairly well-off diet, that their diet was, was full of, of wonderful food. Now, it's difficult to understand the cultural importance of the hunter-gatherer foodstuffs, but we can see that they were fairly well-fed and, and quite healthy in comparison to their um, European counterparts. Now, the Pictish communities are, are interesting. Um, for a long time, it was difficult to understand what the Pictish communities ate. Um, really, the primary evidence did not provide a clear picture of what their diets can, were part of. People for a long time were not able to tell. Usually we looked at images that were on things like um, stonework, but we couldn't really tell. But very recently there was a new discovery um, by archeologists where they found over 137 skeletons. And we believe to be from the Pictish communities and they were buried under the old Tarbet Parish Church in Port Mahomet in Easter Ross in the Highlands. And this has been really, really important in opening up our understanding of the Pictish diet to historians. Now the dig included skeletons ranging from about 150 years, spanning from um, small par farming communities to an area that we think was part of a Pictish monastery. Um, and so we can see the change over time and what people ate, as well as kind of understanding what they consumed. Now, maybe unsurprisingly, they ate plants such as barley, barley being a very important staple crop that was very early in, in Scottish um, development of the agricultural revolution. But they also ate some animal proteins, which included things like venison, beef, lamb, and pork. Um, and these came both from farming as well as hunting. So we do know that the Pictish communities definitely had um, domesticated animals. Um, 
which I think is, is really important. I think the concept of pork in particular is really interesting when it comes to Scotland because uh, pigs were simply used to be consumed. They weren't work animals. And so we can see through the, the idea of pork that they really are using animals in order for food consumption. Now, interestingly, even though they lived in areas close to the coast and we see evidence from early hunter-gatherer societies that they um, that, that they didn't eat fish as much as we thought. Now, it is possible that um, they simply just didn't because they had the foodstuffs available to them. But there is a concept that the fish became so important in Pictish folklore, things like the salmon of knowledge. I have my necklace of the salmon of knowledge, that maybe they become something more important and therefore not to be consumed. Again, this is historians trying to piece together information that from, from things that obviously we don't have a lot about, but maybe the concept being that fish were seen as something um, to not be consumed and instead said be part of, of their concept of themselves. Now, Dr. Curtis Summers, I think, is important when he wrote, we know the picture stone carvings that salmon was a very important symbol for them, possibly derived from early superstitious and folklore beliefs that include stories about magical fish. And that magical fish were somehow really important, um, particularly to this Pictish community. So that is something that I find really interesting since fish has become such an important staple even in Scotland today, that the Picts didn't really consume this type of food. We also can tell that this community ate things like kale, cabbage, beans, turnips, carrots, and wild garlic. Again, this early farming. Um, and so again, we can see that, there, that even from the hunter-gatherer society to these Pictish communities, we're seeing a shift in what people ate based on the priorities of the communities, which I think is a, is a theme that we can see throughout Scotland's food history. And I'm, I'm kind of speeding through these early societies, so I think it gets really interesting in the 18th century. Um, but I wanted you to understand how Scottish food history has kind of shifted over time. So then we get to the Celts and the Vikings. Um, Oh, I should say that we we do believe that the Pictish community did have a brewing, um, a concept of brewing, and that heather ale was probably something also that was really important to those communities. Now, around uh, 2500 BCE, Northern and Central European immigrants appeared, and by about 700, the Celts scuttled in Scotland after being forced out of Ireland from severe food shortages. And so actually what we, that's interesting with that is that being forced out of Ireland and moving into Scotland demonstrated that Scotland's food was considered something that was um, much more sustainable than in the Irish community. Um, and what we find is in that period, the food of Scotland becomes hugely influenced by, by the Celts from Ireland, as well as the Scandinavians or the Vikings. Now we see that the Scandinavia, the Vikings are going to be bringing concepts of the ways to actually preserve foods. And so we see this new wealth of preserved meats coming in. The Celts are definitely going to be more fish um, based on fish. Their diets could be far more based on fish, but we're also going to see things like salting. Salting is, is providing sea salt and, and um, and really preserving the meats in salt. This concept is so that you can eat the foods that are not fresh and really keep that meat in your diet. We're also going to see the concept of smoking. And if any of you have had an Arbroath Smoky, something I'll come to later, you know the importance of smoked meats in Scotland as well. We also see the Vikings are going to bring new breeds of, of cattle in particular. Um, that are going to, again, be very fundamental in the way that Scotland understands food. Um, cattle is something that is um, from the middle, middle Ages onward is going to be a very, very important part of Scottish diet, both for the things that it provides, things like work, but also um, dairy, as well as for the droving communities and, and the meat that it provides. Um, there is suggestion that the Aberdeen Angus, that Angus beef that we know so well, is something that was um, derived from the Scandinavian cattle that was brought over by these Vikings. And, and again, this is, this is really important. A lot of what we see in Scottish culture and Scottish 
uh, foodstuffs is going to be based on interactions with other people. And that shouldn't be surprising. That's pretty much everyone's foodstuffs. So when people say that maybe it's not purely Scottish, and I'm saying that, look, smoked meats come from the Vikings or Scandinavia, that, that doesn't mean that it's not Scottish. It means that it's influenced by the practices of the people that are coming into that island, um, which, which you can see throughout the globe. And, and so the idea of smoked meats is going to be introduced, but then it's going to be made their own, which I think is a really important, important concept. Now, this is where I think it gets interesting. It's the medieval period. Now, the medieval period, as many of you know, was, was driven by a concept of feudalism in one way or another. Um, feudalism looked different in one place versus another, but you can see that with feudalism, there's going to be a clear class structure that is developed in Scotland. And with that class structure, we start to see, even more so than before, this concept of diet being associated with wealth, class, and status. And that the diet of an ordinary person is going to be very different than the diet of royalty, for instance. And with feudalism, the ordinary person is going to be the vast majority of people. And that meant the vast majority of people were living a very, very simple life. A very simple life. Um, we have an indication that they probably never went further than, um, than a manor which would be about 50 acres in the entire lifetime. So the vast majority of people are going to be based in, in one little area. And there's gonna be relatively few wealthy people in society and they're going to have access to more. So what did the ordinary diet look like? Well, for the ordinary diet, you're going to see things that are pretty familiar to our concept of peasant food in Scotland, particularly in the 18th century, things that Robert Burns is going to be talking about and it's this concept of oats and barley and beer and stews and thick soups called potage. And these are going to be the things that the ordinary people are eating. And that's because they're easily grown. Um, they are easily available within the Scottish soils. Now, those that lived close to the sea may have had access to fish. They certainly had more access to salt. Um, but until the 18th century, most ordinary people did not eat meat on a regular basis. They would eat meat products, but not meat. And the reason for that is that a lot of the, the wealth that came to the ordinary people came from the animals that they had domesticated. So for instance, you're not gonna necessarily eat your cow because once you eat it, it's done. But if you're able to have milk, for instance, you can make cheeses, which we know is very much a part of, of the medieval diet and, and dairy products. And if you think about the way that we think of cullen skink or cream-based foods in Scotland, that should be unsurprising. You're also going to use your cattle for work. You're also going to be able to breed your cattle and sell that on. Think about the drovings that occurred in medieval Scotland. And so eating your meat as an ordinary person would really take away a lot of the wealth that you could have and the sustenance you have for your family. And so a lot of this meat, unless you lived close to the shore where you could fish, is really going to be preserved for the upper classes. Um, now, consumption of fish did become more popular as the Roman Catholic Church instituted fasting days, uh, particularly during Lent. And that's when we see fish become far more um, involved in the medieval diet. But again, that was much more cultural driven necess than, than necessarily because they had access to it. Um, Sugars are going to be difficult to come by, but honey isn't, and honey is going to be used to sweeten food. We see eggs being consumed, which means that there's definitely chickens around. Again, you're not going to slaughter the chicken, you're going to use the eggs because the eggs get keep being produced. Now, oats are going to be the staple food. Most areas in the medieval period are going to have a, a staple crop, and oats and barley, barley first, and then oats are going to be really important. A 14th century French chronicler by the name of Jean Poissart noted that Scottish soldiers carried bags of oatmeal with them, small bags of oatmeal with them in order to make their own oat cakes. It's kind of this early thing of, of being able to have your oats made that you could have your food. And so oats became something really, really important to the Scottish diet. And interesting, before the agricultural improvements of the 18th century, uh, Barley was something that was cultivated very, very highly in the um, 
and the Scottish Highlands uh, because barley grew well there. I mean, if you think about the Highlands themselves, you're not going to be growing a lot of things in the mountains. You're going to have to be growing in the, the valley areas. And as a result, you're going to have to figure out what grows and barley and oats were really easily grown um, there. And so you're going to see that being a big part of the diet. So that's going to be the ordinary person. But wealthy Scots are going to have a different story. These few rich people are going to have a beautifully diverse um, diet. Landowners enjoyed game hunting on their estates. They would catch fish in the rivers. We see the medieval period, including salmon and, and luscious foods. Um, you're going to see things like partridge being eaten, wild boar, venison, rabbit, grouse, other game birds, things that have gone out of style were very, very popular on the medieval table. Swan was a delicacy. Peacock was apparently something that was loved. And you're going to see that this is not going to be necessarily used as, as a favorite food or something that's going to be eaten all the time, but it becomes a symbol of wealth. So being able to eat your venison that you got off the estate or being able to eat the swan or being able to eat the grouse that was caught during um, the hunting season is going to be a symbol of Scottish wealth and privilege, something that the people that were working on the estate simply would not have access to. And as I said, this concept of class being a signifier, a food being a signifier of class really, really develops. And so you think about not just how, what foods they're eating, but how they're going to be presented. The medieval table filled with jellies, the medieval table that's going to be filled with meats and fatty foods really signifies that wealth and that feudal structure and, and what the royalty was able to eat. Uh, they also enjoyed an array of fruits that could be turned into uh, fritters or other delicacies. They also, unlike the, or, the ordinary people, people were able to access spices. Uh, the trade networks, and particularly the Crusades, uh, allowed for people to use things like pepper or cinnamon um, in their foods. Now, this is gonna be really interesting because if you look at a lot of the recipes, it's like, let's just throw all the spices we can in there. It seems as if it's like, who cares what the spice is? We're gonna add it. And that becomes a signifier of the wealth of the people. So the more spices you can add to your food, obviously the better off you are. And so in order to show off to those that are visiting, you're gonna be adding all those spices that you can. And then we have that influence of the old alliance, the French cuisine. As the medieval period advanced, trade between Scotland and European countries, particularly France, began to absolutely flourish. Um, and with that, we're going to see the food of Scotland changing. And many of the foods that we still associate with Scotland, things like uh, shortbread or haggis or things like that, are going to have those French undertones to them. Uh, records from a banquet held in the court of James IV includes dozens of deer, boar, piglets, and a Florentine pie made of oysters, rabbit, and other meats encased in pastry. Um, this concept of using pastry uh, was a European concept that was influenced in, was, had influence in Scotland. We also the, see the emergence of that first haggis. Although not confirmed, we believe that the haggis was created out of necessity as people needed to carry their foods with them. And so putting the offal into the sheep's stomach for easy transport would be something that, that would be used. We also know that this type of concept of being able to encase in a sheep's stomach was used in Europe. Um, not necessarily the haggis that we know, but these sausages. Uh, and, and this concept was, was something that probably came from these interactions. Strong French influences, particularly in the 16th century when Mary de Guise, Lorraine married James V, uh, can be seen particularly because she brought her French chefs to the Scottish court. And they certainly started to, to present themselves as Scottish but really use these French influences. And Scotland was okay with it, partly because the royalty of Scotland was very much associated with France. Mary Queen of Scots, uh, her favorite food arguably was supposed to be the potage à la reine. In it, we can see that it's apparently almonds. You beat them, you boil them in a good broth, you add a bundle of herbs um, and a piece of lemon. 
Uh, you make sure not to burn it. You add some broth, mushrooms, strain through a linen cloth and sprinkle it over a partridge. And then you can consume it together with some, some it says juices of pistachios. And so even, even uh, Mary Queen of Scots, who, as we know, grew up in France, is going to be bringing her favorite meals and having them in the Scottish court. The importance of this food cannot be understated. And I think that this can be seen particularly when you look at things like wills. Now, we all know the fate of Mary, Queen of Scots. She was beheaded at the, be the bequest of her cousin, Elizabeth I. Um, and obviously, she's going to be leaving a will. And her will actually included quite a lot of information for food historians. Mary left her preserves and her confitures to her apothecary. This demonstrated that they were enough importance to be named in her final will and testament. She's going to be leaving herbs. She's going to be leaving food stuff. She's going to be leaving preserved things to her apothecary. Now, food as it is today is often not only seen as something to consume, but something for health benefits. And so being able to leave this to an apothecary demonstrates that she not only thought of the food as important uh, to her, but also to, to health in general. So many of the foods that we see as hugely important to Scotland today come from this old alliance. Things like cockaliki soup, which is Scotland's national soup, originated from a chicken and onion soup that was eaten in France. Onions were replaced with leeks in Scotland. And we find the first printed recipe from this in 1598, although uh, the name was first recorded in the 18th century. There is some indication of the origin of shortbread can be traced back to the court of Mary, Queen of Scots, and that her French pastry chefs came to, to create this. Early shortbread is going to be actually a savory dish, um, pretty much just pastry. The concept is, that's why it's called shortbread, is that it's a short pastry, which means it's going to crumble. Um, and sugar was, was added later. But again, we're going to see this early concept of shortbread, this cookie that is so associated with Scotland, coming from the French influence. Now, wheat was actually very hard to grow in Scotland. And so the breads that we really associate with Scotland, um, bannocks or pastries are really gonna be something that only the wealthy are gonna have access to because wheat is gonna be a very difficult thing to come by. And only later does it become available to, to the everyman. Now this is my favorite part, and this is where I think it gets interesting. The 18th century is going to show a food revival and Scots revival and national identity is going to become extremely associated with Scottishness. And this is partly because of things like the Treaty of Union, the Jacobite rebellions, and the aftermath of this concept of Anglicization that occurred in the 18th century. Now, I have a difficult time with the concept of Anglicization, but really what this concept is, is that after 1745 and the, the um, Jacobite rebellion and the failed Battle of Culloden, people in Scotland had to re-identify themselves as something that could be associated as purely British. And the reason for this, and particularly Lowland Scotland, was the concept that rather than being seen as this other or this rebellious nation, Scotland should be seen as something that's going to be useful to this larger concept of Britain. Remember, this is also going to be the beginnings of the importance of the British Empire, of which Scotland is going to become really, really important, particularly those Scottish regiments. And so many people in Scotland are going to try to present themselves as something that can be seen as fully British. And in many ways, this meant um, taking on English ideas. Now, this is going to be very important in the Scottish Enlightenment, for instance. Thomas Sheridan's going to go around and teach people how to take Scots out of their language in Edinburgh. You know, you're going to have David Hume talking about how people need to speak English rather than Scots. You're going to see this coming up in, in the ways that the Republic of Letters is going to, to kind of see Britishness as the, the best rather than necessarily just Scots and English. And this is going to show up in their foods as well. Banquets and sociable foods are now going to be more in line with the English and European tastes. You're going to see things like tea and coffee shops and chocolate shops and different wines being associated with 
with Scotland, um, something that is seen as British rather than necessarily just Scots. You're going to see things like beefsteak being served in, in various places because beefsteak being associated with, with England. There's also going to be issues of trying to not see themselves as, as country or provincial, but fully incorporated. Because there's going to be this stereotype in the 18th century, particularly in England, that Scots are somehow backwards and Scottish Scots are going to try to challenge this concept. And I think this, this stereotype of Scotland and backward in the 18th century is, is signified by the famous quote by Dr. Samuel Johnson. Then he writes that in his dictionary, that oats are a grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. I mean, the Scotophobia in England is pretty clear in just that simple definition of oats by Samuel Johnson. And a lot of people, particularly in the lowlands, are going to try to challenge this concept very, very clearly. But at the same time, we're going to have this revival, almost challenging this concept of, of Anglicization. And this, I think, is going to be signified most by our friend over here, Robert Burns. Robert Burns is a polite gentleman in Edinburgh society, and yet he's also going to be saying, using the Scots language and talking about Scots foods as, as something to be maintained and something that's going to be important. So there's almost this um, budding of, of concepts. How do we become British, but also maintain our Scottish identity? And I think Robert Burns is really important in doing that. And I think um, his address to the Hagness signifies the importance of food in this. And while I know we've all heard it, I love this rendition. I'd love to show you this address to the Haggis. And we can talk a little bit about what Burns is saying in his understanding of, of Scottish foods as being something associated with Scotland in particular in relation to other places in the world. So let's let's watch. Fair fa your honest sonsy face, great chieftain o' the pudding race, I've been the ma you tack your place, pinch, tripe or thrame. Will are you worthy o' a grace as lang as my arm? Your groaning trenches there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill, your pin would help mend the mill in time o' need, and through your pores your dews distill like amber bead. His knife say rustic labour dicht, and cut you up with ready slicht, trenching your gushing entrails bricked like on a ditch. But then, oh, <laughs> what a sect! Warm, reeking, and rich. Then horn for horn they stretch and strive, deal take the hindmost on they drive, till ah, the wheel swelled kites by are bent like drums. The old goodman's mace like to arrive. Be thank it hums. Well, is there that hour as French ragout, or olio that would store sue, or fricassee that would mack her spew with perfect sconner, looks doon with sneering scornful view on sick a dinner? Poor devil, see him hour as trash, as feckless as a withered rash. His spindle shank a good whip lash, his neve a knit, and through bloody flood or field to dash, oh, how unfit. But mark the rustic haggis fed. The trembling earth resounds its tread. Clap his wally neave a blade, he'll mack it whistle. And legs and arms and heads he'll sned like taps o' thristles. Your powers wha mack mankind your care, and dish them out their bill of fare. Old Scotland wants nane of your skinkin' wear that jops in luggies. But if you wish her great foo prayer, gear a haggis. Now that's fun, he's dressed as Burns, he's doing that, but I think the address of the haggis is actually quite important in understanding food history in Scotland. Because what Burns is saying is, hey, all of these influences that are coming from other places are great, but we really need to go back to our culture, our history. And the haggis in particular becomes a symbol of that. This reference to French foods, in particular fricassee and oleo, um, that was Sta Sue, uh, demonstrates this concept of, hey, look, our provincial foods are good too, and that they are filled with, with important things that are important for Scotland. And this, again, is, is 
seems kind of um, a little silly, but really it demonstrates this idea that Scotland at this time is dealing with these these difficult avenues of trying to figure out, okay, how can we be British, but how can we purely be Scottish? And how can we be a member of the European community while maintaining our own identity? And Haggis in and of itself becomes a very important symbol of that, partly because of Burns poem. And so again, food now, not only is it gonna be sustaining, it's not only just a class signifier, but now it's one that's associated with what Scotland really is and who they want to be seen as on this global stage. And this brings us to a more important concept is this impact of empire and expanded trade and the way that that's going to be associated with Scottish foodstuffs. Now, as many of you know, spots benefited greatly from their relationship with empire. And one aspect of that is the rise of sugar. With this rise of sugar, you see the development of more sweets and having sugar be available to the masses. Now, this is only going to be available because of empire and particularly the slave trade associated with it, particularly in the Caribbean. And we're going to see tons of that sugar being brought back into Scotland. Um, and I think that that's going to be really important when we think of things like tablet. Tablet being um, really the culmination of sugar and cream. We're going to see that lovely, lovely sugary dish dating back to the 1700s and that early empire and that importance of adding sugar. And again, this is going to be seen as Scotland achieving. The more sugar you're able to access, the wealthier you are, the more better off you are. This is also, I mean, something that you can associate with marmalade. Now, while Paddington has made it so that we think the marmalade is associated with, with London, it really is a distinctive Scottish spread. Um, and it's going to be packed with things that don't grow in Scotland. Oranges. We're not going to find many oranges being grown natively in Scotland. We're not going to be seeing sugar cane there. And yet we're going to have really important Dundee marmalade factories. Think of Keeler's marmalade. It's going to be something that's really, really important to Scottish ideas. And Dundee is jam jute and marmalade, you know, is going to be really associated with this marmalade trade. Um, Empire is going to be so important that you're going to see that even the the uh, the architecture is going to be associated with it. You can see that the pineapple pineapple building here, um, very few pineapples are going to be grown in Scottish soils, and so you're going to see this diet being associated with that. In many of Enlightenment societies, you're going to have the punch bowl be a symbol of conviviality and sociability, and that punch is going to be filled with things like rum, rum coming from. Um, the sugar cane of empire, you're going to see sugar, you're going to see uh, things like pineapples and oranges and citrus fruits being associated with it as well. Again, just this symbol of Scotland's relationship with the wider empire. And there you go, you're going to see that's the tablet and marmalade that I spoke about. Now with the enlightenment, we're going to have what we call the second agricultural revolution and this concept of an improved diet. The agricultural revolution in Scotland led to a move from the run rig system of subsistence farming to one that was based on a single crop to support landowners' coffers. And with this, the diet of Scotland is going to change, and it's not going to be for the better. It's going to become significantly less diverse. The growth of sporting estates led to Scotland's larder becoming more of an industry than something to feed the people. The railways further expanded the scope of the market with Scots grouse at a premium on English menus after the glorious 12th. The vast majority of people in Scotland are not gonna have access to the grouse as it's going to be something that's gonna be for pleasure hunting on larger estates. This aligns with the period of what we call the Highland Clearances and the rise of the Industrial Revolution in which urbanization and the rise of the working class led to a society that was far more reliant on cheap foodstuffs um, than necessarily anything else. This is where we're going to see the development of things like the scotch pie, for instance, where you have the mince encased in pastry. In the 19th century, we're going to see um, the potato become really important as well, very similar to what's happening in Ireland. Now, the potato is going to first arrive in Scotland in the 16th century, but it's going to quickly become a staple of much of the people's diets. Um, 
very similar to what's happening in Ireland. Now, the Irish certainly were more, I'm going to go to the 19th century here, the Irish were certainly more associated with the potatoes and they were far more reliant on the potato, but the potato was extremely important in Scotland. And this is going to lead to the potato famine in the Highlands in the 1840s. That's going to be caused by the same blight that's occurring in Ireland. And it's going to lead to starvation and deaths of many Highlanders. And this is really what's going to lead to the 1.7 million Scots leaving for places like the USA and Canada and Australia. Along with the Highland clearances, this potato blight is going to also have a huge influence. Now, by 1857, the famine is going to be over and potatoes are going to make a comeback. And they have been an important part of the Scottish diet ever since. If you think like, you know, tatties that are going to go along with your haggis, tatty scones, steak pies, mash, Cullen skink are all going to be associated with the potato. So again, the potato is going to be really important. At the same time that many people are starving, again, we have this class issue arising, is that we're going to be having the romanticization of Scottish foods. Queen Victoria, while loving English fare, also incorporated Scottish traditional foods into her banquets. We also see the continuing of traditions in communities, like the eating of shortbread on special occasions, um, in Shetland, for instance, the concept of a bride coming in, you would break shortbread over her head as she entered the house to signify the marriage. So again, we're going to have a ton of this, this change as a result of what's going to be happening in people's in lives, in the agricultural issues that are occurring, in the improved nature of farming, and the food is going to change with it, probably unsurprisingly. Okay. This takes us to the 20th century. Availability of certain foods in Scotland suffered in the 20th century as it did many places as a result of rationing, particularly as a result of these two world wars that occurred. And we're also going to see the creation of large scale industrial agriculture, which certainly is going to limit the diversity of food available to the average person. It's really important to point out that actually the diversity of food of the Middle Ages is going to be arguably more diverse than what we are going to have available to us today. Um, there's going to be far more versions of different crops available rather than the improved crops that we use in our diets more readily now. The empire and beyond also started to introduce other foods into our, our concept of Scottish identity, the Italian chip shop is going to be something important, fish and chips, when you're going to Scotland. Now, of course, you're going to have Scottish fish be associated with that. But again, you're going to have many of the chip shops being created by, by Italians. Um, you're going to have the Indian restaurants. The, some of the best Indian food I've ever had has been places. And the tikka masala um, is, is arguably created in Glasgow because of that imperial relationship with India. Scotch pies are going to be associated with football and football associations. So they're going to turn into football thighs. And I think the thing that did the most uh, important is this concept of iron brew. Now, iron brew is going to be something that is hugely important in Scotland. I'm sure all of you have tried iron brew. There's always a discussion amongst Americans of what it tastes like. Um, my husband's from King UC right outside of Inverness. And whenever I say I think it tastes like bubblegum, he tells me that that is absolutely not accurate. Although to me, it tastes like bubblegum, uh, orange bubblegum. Um, Iron Brew uh, is outsells Coca-Cola in Scotland. I think it's only one of two places where Coke is outsold by a different soda. And I think Iron Brew is a really great indication of how something can be influenced by outside sources and become something that is purely Scottish. So the first iron brew drink was produced by Moss and Wildenstein Chemical Companies in 1889 by the name of Iron Brew. So I-R-O-N-B-R-E-W. So um, iron, as in like pumping iron. Um, a similar drink was produced a year later in London by Stevenson and Howell, neither of which are going to be in Scotland. Oh, the first one was actually in the United States. A.G. Barr the one that we think of today, the Bar Iron Brew, first launched its version a year later than that in 1899, but it has its official launch in 1901. And what's really interesting, I actually have a can downstairs, I should bring it up, is that you can buy um, soda that says it's the original flavoring or the original recipe of Iron Brew. 
my interesting fact about Iron Brew is that after the Second World War, when uh, the NHS was coming out with concepts of health, they actually had, were forced to change their name from I-R-O-N-B-R-E-W to the Iron Brew we know today, I-R-N-B-R-U, uh, because it said that it, that the, the label gave spurious health claims and that they were going to be able to solve anemia and that they couldn't have iron in the name or people would think that they were going to be able to have some type of drink that provided for their iron. Since then, Iron Brew has become something that is completely associated with Scotland. And again, is, is seen like that worldwide. Um, very few countries are going to have it. And if they do, uh, they're probably not going to outsell Coke in the way that this, this important drink has become associated with Scotland. And this brings us to today. Modern Scotland has an amazing array of restaurants and foods and that that concept of Scottish food, that stereotype is simply inaccurate. There are many Michelin restaurants, a wealth of locally grown produce and has really become a foodie center of the world. People are going to Scotland in order to have access to, to the foods that are becoming available. And Scottish foods have had a huge influence on the rest of the world. Canadian indigenous people talk about bannock, and this is going to come from the Scottish Highland bread, originally man from the bannock stain. Hot dogs, Campbell's soup, Kellogg cereal, Taco Bell, and even Doritos have Scottish founders. And many of the foods that we think of today are going to come from, from many of these concepts of Scotland. And so I think that what I want to end with is that a lot of what you're seeing throughout my talk is this idea that Scotland's food has changed over time. And that many of the, the ways that we understand Scottish food have been influenced by global uh, peoples and, and influences from other nations. Now, this does not make it less Scottish. The one great thing that Scotland does, it does many great things, but one of the great things Scotland does is to take things from other places and make them their own and make it into something wonderful. We've seen this throughout history and food is no different. And so when you're doing things like eating Cullen skink, you can think about the history of, of fishing in Scotland and the potato blight. When you're think, eating things like the Arbro Smoky, you can think about the Scandinavian influences on Scottish smoked meats. When you're thinking of a, when you're going to Greg's and getting a Scotch pie, you can think of that industrialization and the importance of the pies and the early pastries. And when you're eating things like tablet, you can understand that concept of empire and sugar being so important in Scotland. Food is far more than just sustenance. It is a symbol of who we are. And I think Scotland's food is does just that. And thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, bravo, bravo, Sarah. That was just wonderful. And I know everyone is anxious to engage with you. So please everyone unmute your microphones and turn your cameras back on. And let's have some discussion question answer with uh, Dr. Jinnick today. I know that that was a quick, quick overview of Scotland's history of food, you know, thousands of years, but hopefully I can answer some of your questions. So, so I have a question. I apologize for not being on camera. I'm driving it like this. Um, but Scotland's a, a big place with a lot of varying topography. How much did mm -hmm. the diet vary in the various regions? Oh, hugely, hugely. Um, again, you're going to see, for instance, the highlands are going to be associated with far more oats because of what's going to grow. I mean, the thing is, is that particularly in the highlands, that run rig system, um, the run rig system is where you're going to have like little, it's almost like you have mounds and you're going to have subsistence farming. Um, you're really only going to grow what you can grow. You know, the growing season is going to be really short. So oats and staple crops are going to be very um, much what you have. And if you're not next to water, if you're not on the coast, you're not going to have a lot of protein in your diet because you're not going to have access to the fish and you're not going to be eating your cattle. So again, you're going to see that highland food being a lot less diverse than what you're going to have on the coasts. 
uh, versus what you're going to have in the lowlands where you have more of that English market as well, as well as access to other places in Europe. So the diet is going to change significantly where you are. Um, in the 18th century, we're going to start seeing the trade throughout Scotland increase. And so you're going to see having people, people having a lot more access to foods throughout Scotland. But before that, you're right, it's going to be very regional. Um, place on the coast, you're going to have kelping, for instance, you're going to have a lot more access to salt um, and, and, um, and fish and things like that. So you're, you're absolutely right. It is very regional. And that's partly why you see foods coming out. Like it's why you have the Arbroath Smoky. You're going to have the four for bright. You're going to have a lot of these foods being associated with a particular place in Scotland as well. So that's a great question and, and very much so, because you're right that, I mean, where Connie is right now, the topography of, of Galloway versus what's gonna be in Sutherland. I mean, the growing season is gonna be completely different and what you're able to actually access. Um, but trade's gonna be really important. I mean, you're gonna have these drovers going from the Highlands down to England quite often and bringing with them some foods, but it's not gonna be something that everybody has access to. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've read um, a lot about the black Kylo cattle in the Highlands in the 1600s and 1700s. So they, they seem like they were very small. They weren't like the picture of the Aberdeen Angus, Angus that you had. They were almost like, mm -hmm. seemed like Great Dane size. Oh, they're did, very did little. People, yeah. Did people eat? I mean, I guess it, it seems like if they were droving them, that there was basically a source of meat. Was that mainly for the English then? Is that, or, did, or was it consumed in Scotland itself? And I was also, you know, wondering about sheep since, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ultimately the, the cattle got displaced by sheep, which was part of the reasons for the clearances about what the influence of, of, uh, of um, you know, mutton and so on was on, on the diet as well. So those were two things I was kind of curious about. Absolutely. Um... You're going to see beef becoming more important later in 19th century um, in the diet. Before that, you're going to have cattle being hugely important. I mean, if you're going to look at like 16th century records, droving and like cattle thievery, like if you're thinking Rob Roy and all that kind of stuff is going to be huge. So cattle is going to be very important. Um, but you're right. The meat is not necessarily for the Scottish market. The vast majority of people aren't going to be eating it. They're going to be making cheeses. They're going to be using the milk. And that's partly because it's it's what you're going to sell, really. I mean, if they'd have access to the meat, and they would certainly be used every once in a while, but if you eat your meat, you're not going to have it to sell or to breed, right? And so you're right, you're not going to have like that, um, that, that kind of being a staple. And that's partly why we see the beef steak becoming the symbol of, of English food. A lot of that beef is going to be coming from Scotland down through the droving community. So they're not going to be eating a lot of it. Um, and the, the sheep, you're absolutely right. Part of the issue with the Highland clearances is that these people are gonna be displaced for cheap farm because it's really gonna be lucrative. And we are gonna see lamb become part of the diet, but again, this is not gonna necessarily be for the average Scottish market. You know, the average person, now the upper class is certainly gonna have associate, be associated with lambs and, and mutton, but the average person, they're either being displaced or this is going to be something that's gonna be bringing money in um, so it really doesn't become part of the diet. Because again, if you're eating it, then you're not making the money from it. And so it's interesting how places, particularly in the Highlands, are associated with the cattle and the sheep, but we're not really seeing that incorporated fully into the diet the way that you might think of. Again, it's there, but it's not going to be something that we're really going to be seeing. Haggis, again, is going to be from the offcuts of a lot of it, right? This is not going to be the like delicious cut like a lamb we're not going to have that we're, this is the awful that's coming from things like sheep so again this this idea that if you're going to use one you're going to use all of it does that help sure but particularly you know that, in the middle ages the 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 cattle is i mean you're going to see far more cheeses and milk and cream products um coming from it rather than the meat in the diet because that's you know that's sustainable you can keep getting that for what they were selling, though, is that mainly for for beef, or was that for uh, dairy components of it as well? Um, my understanding is it's both. Um, I mean, and again, again, the droving also is important because in certain times of year, the cattle is not going to be necessarily able to be sustained on the the grass that's in the highlands, right? You know, you're going to have to be able to keep them, so they're going to be moving them. But you're right; it's it's from my understanding, it's mostly for the beef 
that it's being used for, but I'm, um, but I can't imagine it wouldn't be used for the dairy as well. I don't know much about what it was. I, I read in the that. Highlands that sometimes when people were starving, they would actually bleed the cattle they would use in droving and mix it with oatmeal and things as a way of, of sustaining themselves. That's your black pudding for you. Mm -hmm. now, did that come from Ireland? I know, I know the national sort of um, epic of Ireland or the cattle raids of Cooley, and it yep. seemed like that was a Celtic like way of life where, where wealth was measured and how large your, your cattle herds were. And they were thinking of them, of them more as lives. I mean, almost as wild where people would go and steal them back and forth, which is the reaving. Oh, did that, absolutely. did that come from Ireland and into Scotland with this, with the, you know, with the Western Scotland influence you know, from, from the Celts? You know, I'm not sure where that began. Um, but I would, I mean, if I was going to hazard a guess, I would think, yeah, because remember that the, the Celtic community is going to be coming from Ireland into Scotland, partly because of those food shortages. And so, and you're going to see people going back and forth all the time. So a lot of times it's really difficult to know what came from Ireland and what came from Scotland because of these communities going back and forth. But absolutely, I, I mean, from from what I know of that period, I would not be surprised if that wasn't an Irish Irish influence. Um, I mean, again, it's really difficult because a lot of like when we're talking about the Celtic communities, they they're very similar, you know, um, in in Scotland and Ireland in the in the early you know the early period, and so it's difficult to know. But I think you're 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 probably spot on um, because you do see those cattle ratings occurring in both places. So you alluded to something at the at the beginning of your talk because the the Pictish people were Celtic also they spoke a different mm -hmm. dialect of Gaelic or or, mm -hmm. or Celtic languages than than the Gaelic people who were coming from Ireland and invading. Mm -hmm. Did you sort of see a mixture of what the two groups were eating as they started to commingle and 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 become more of a unified group? Absolutely. And it's really, and again, the records are difficult to, to kind of figure out, right? Like we don't have written records from the Pictish community um, in the same way that we would of the medieval period and things like that and, and the Gallic community. Um, but you're absolutely right. A lot of, I mean, a lot of Scottish history is talk, is and food history is this commingling of cultures. Um, and what is interesting about that, um, that burial dig that I was talking about is that you're going to see it change over time over 150 years and you're going to see the incorporation of different foodstuffs into it. Now it's really difficult to understand where that came from. Is it because of climate changes that occurred and people having access to food? Is it the commingling of people? I'm not sure, but you certainly see those shifts. And I would be very surprised if the commingling of people didn't influence because every other time in Scottish history it did, you know, with the French influences and the Scandinavian influences and the, you know, um, the imperial influences, that's something that we can see pretty clearly throughout food history, is that when two groups of people come together, you have that cultural, you know, syncretic, syncricity, whatever word that is. But, you know, I mean, that cultural intermingling is going to result in something new. So, again, I'm, I can't speak particularly to that, but I, get, but, um, but I think you're spot on in that the food is going to change because those two peoples are coming together. Sarah, we do have a question from David. He wonders if you can speak about the image of the Quaker Oats logo. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know about the Quaker Oats logo. Let's see. That's okay. Uh, I think his point was it, it seems to be a, an upstanding image and not an you know, image. Of, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering, you know, the Quaker community, is Quaker Oats from... Where is it from? I'd be interested in looking into that. If you know anything about it, I'd love to learn more. I'm wondering if it's more yeah. of, it's, is it Pennsylvania? They actually talk about that. They, they talk about that interestingly in the new Jerry Seinfeld movie, um, Unfrosted. Um, really? Where they're, where they're, yeah, where they're joking a lot about that with Quaker Oats and the, and the you know, origin of, uh, of, of that versus Kellogg's and um, Post Cereal. So if you're, you're into food, if you haven't seen that, you, you probably get a the kick out of it. I started it. It's, yeah. it's Quaker Oats from, I would think it's, you know, the Quakers, I'm, I'm thinking of Pennsylvania. Is that where, I don't, I don't know, but I no, know. No, 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 not at all. It's, it's from Chicago. Is um, it? This is, yes, this is from well, the I Scots. I learn of, something about it then. This is um, Scots of Chicago, the North Shore. And George Douglas was born in Caithness, Scotland. And he and his five brothers moved to Canada where George married Margaret Boyd, who was born of Ulster Scots parents. Mm -hmm. 
In Illinois, George worked for the Northwestern Railroad. In Iowa, George and John Stewart from Bampshire, Scotland, and they formed Douglas and Stewart Oats, which eventually would operate under the name of Quaker Oats. So really? That's a, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know and that. It's That's really wonderful to, to learn. I, and I can also Chicago. tell you that that uh, the Quaker Oats in Chicago here and they're headquartered had their own pipe right. band back in the 40s. 50s, oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Do you know what year? What year was that? The 40s and 50s, I would say. It was the 40s and 50s? Okay. That's, in I mean, because when I think of Oats and Scotland, I think of the Scots Porridge Oats, you know, with the... Like the I actually band. have film of that band with the uh, bass drum insignia with the Quaker Oats insignia on it. Wow. That's yes. really cool. I'm going to have to learn. I See, I love these things because I get to learn more about that as well. I'm going to look that up. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I didn't know about the Quaker Oats. Yeah, Maya, so the, the, Quaker, the Quaker image is just branding. It has nothing to do with the is? origin. Yes. Why? So. Do we know? Just, well, as as someone else just said, you know, it's uh, kind of upstanding, pure, you know, Peaceful. purity. You know, right. Yes. So. That's really interesting. My period in particular is I do 18th and 19th century. So um, history. And so, um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the modern period, but I'm much more I much more study the 18th and 19th century. So th but that is that is fascinating. And I'm definitely going to look into that. And it's interesting yeah. with the branding. Wait, we have another question from Bev Becker. She says, I grew up with a food called hot pot, originally prepared by my Scottish great grandmother who came to the US in 1870. Have you heard of this dish prepared with potatoes, onions, and chunks of cooked meat? Yep, absolutely. It's very much like the stews or the pottage, the stews that you're gonna have in Scotland. And I think that, um, I'm not sure of the hot pot coming particularly from there, but it's very, I'm not surprised because that stewing, that kind of um, stewing offcuts in particular, think about like stew meats are not gonna be the ones that you're gonna necessarily have as steaks. You're gonna be the things that you're gonna be eating um, after they've you know been, been stewed for a long time. And the potatoes and onions in particular, you'd probably have more leeks in Scotland than onions, but those potatoes, it's very much gonna be associated with that area. I mean, you think about it, you're gonna have the stews coming from Scotland, you're also gonna have stews coming from Ireland. So um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's cool. What is the story with marmalade about how the rinds came from, I think, Spain or something? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how did I mean, it's very yeah. unlikely as you had you had mentioned that. What, what's the, the whole story behind that industry and how it got started in Scotland? So the marmalade industry, again, this is going to be coming from Spain. I think that there's there was I'll have to let me look this up really quickly. I actually had something on marmalade, but my understanding was is that there was a the the apocryphal story is that there was a ship that had a ton of of several oranges. That was uh, my understanding was, and I, I might get have this wrong. It's been a little while. Is that I think it was it was shipwrecked or something, and that they had to save all the oranges, and then that was the concept of marmalade. I don't know if that's absolutely accurate or um, or anything like that, but but again, this is this. I th well, the way that I wanted to present marmalade is that this is in Scotland, right? You're going to have Scotland being the center of marmalade production, Dundee in particular. And yet almost all of the ingredients are going to be from outside of Scotland, right? You're going to have this thing that Scotland's going to make their own. Like we do marmalade. We're going to do Keeler marmalade in particular. And yet we're going to use several oranges and we're from, from Spain. And we're going to use sugar from Empire. And yet we're going to call it Scottish. And that's, I think, really the thing that I wanted to kind of point out is that something that is Scottish has no Scottish ingredients in it, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, if you think about it, like a lot of these things, tablets and, you know, the sugars, like you're going to have something that is completely associated with Scot Scottish identity, particularly the city of Dundee with zero Scottish ingredients, except for maybe the water, you know, think about it. Like, and that I think is so Scottish. <laughs> If you look throughout history to be able to take these ingredients, take things from other places, influences from other places and use them as their own is so important. Um, so I can't remember. I'll look it up and I'll let you know. I think that was the story about the several oranges. Um, I could be completely wrong, but that's what I think what I remembered. But I think but I, I just love this concept that something that can be in no way associated with Scottish growing 
can be something that's Scottish. I mean, you go like, you know, pineapples become something that was completely associated with sociability in Scotland. And yet I think that they like, I mean, who's growing pineapples in Scotland? You know, punch and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the marmalade is in particular is, is a wonderful story. Just how, how you can create something and make it Scottish that's not Scottish at all. Any other questions? Yeah, well, just another uh, comment. You know, I, I, it's fascinating to talk about, as you've laid out, the global and imperial influences on Scottish cuisine. But, you know, there was a, a the adverse side of that was how Scotland got integrated into the global economy and how food production in Scotland then became a global, uh, you know, enterprise the hair yep. how the herring industry herring industry you know fed the baltic and how you know Absolutely. the cattle trade you know and and then the social ramifications of that in terms of how it changed you know class structure in scotland and you know it, it was hardly just the clearances that drove people away from scotland it was you know oh, the huge. whole impact of the in industrial you know economy on, on scottish folks and uh Absolutely. so yeah, so that all ties in. It's very interesting. Absolutely. The rise of globalization. I mean, you're going to see this influence everywhere for this globalized society and, and people, people having to find a way into it. And this urbanization and industrialization is going to drive a ton of people away. You know, you're not going to have the ability to have the jobs or the, the way that you lived. And so you're absolutely right. Tom Devine talks about this a lot um, in his works. Uh, I remember when I was doing a PhD program with him, he could say, where's your healing clearances, New McCaslin? He would always say to me, because... He said that people gave the Highland Clearances far more credit for this immigration than necessarily um, it had earned because there was, you know, this much larger industrialization that's going to drive people out. And again, you're right, this globalization of food, a lot of the food is now going to be made for an external market rather than the people themselves in Scotland. Um, and you're going to see that in a lot of places. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, there's the, you know, as you pointed out in the, you know, the the way in which the foods of the empire came back and are, are now, you know, like tiki masala and all the, you know, uh, you know, the, the foods of the empire became, you know, internalized as Scottish foods and so common. And, uh, you know, it's I think of like episodes of Shetland where, where they want to go out for fast food. Well, let's go get a curry is always the, well, the fault, right? <laughs> I mean, the best curry I've ever had was, was in Scotland. I mean, yeah. absolutely. This this empire and the spices, you'd have to think about the spice trade coming through as well. You know, right. a lot of the empire is hugely influential in Scotland. Yeah. And arguably, even though the empire is no longer exists, it's still influential in the way that, you know, Scottish cuisine is, is understood. Right. You think about how much sugar. I mean, sugar is huge. I mean, the impact, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about food, the one thing that I could have gone into and didn't was just the impact of slavery on Scottish yes. food, right? Yeah. This huge yes. thing of like having this, you know, enforced labor is going to change how people eat. You know, think of coffees and teas and all of these luxury goods that become a symbol of wealth in Scotland and have become incorporated into the cuisine is because of forced labor in the Americas in particular, um, which I, again, I didn't have time to go into, but that really influences what people ate. And in turn, you know, impacted uh, foreign policy in Britain and the wars that are fought and how they're fought and who fights them, including lots of Scots who died in the Caribbean, you know, fighting for fighting for sugar, basically. And, oh, in addition absolutely. To Maine, you're right. So. I mean, it, and you can see the influences of wars as well. One of the interesting things um, when I was looking at a St. Andrew's Society minute book was how many people stopped drink, how many societies stopped drinking French wine during the Napoleonic Wars as a symbol of being, you know, of, of Britishness and how we can't right. drink French wines. We're going to have to make our own wines now and not drink French wine. And these boycotts as well um, mm -hmm. become really interesting. The salt cod, salt cod was used to feed a lot of the slave population in the Caribbean. Were, were the Scottish um, fishing 
you know, industry like some of the other places like Portugal and so on, uh, and and in North America, involved in that um, in that industry as well with uh, with uh, fishing for cod. You know, I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. I'd have to look that up. Um, I'm not sure. That's that's a that's a really interesting question, though. Sarah, a uh, question for you. It's interesting to me that you didn't include scotch whiskey uh -huh. uh, and you didn't include tobacco, which played mm -hmm. a big role in, especially during yeah. the industrial yeah. period here. Um, it, I'm, I'm wondering about your definition of food and, and why you chose to leave the scotch out. So one of the reasons I, I because, partly because I only had so much time. <laughs> because you'd have to talk about, you know, the whiskey, but then you'd also have to talk about the taxation and you'd have to talk about the illicit whiskey industry. And then you'd have to talk about how it became something that, you know, became commercialized as scotch and then Diageo and all of those things. So partly it was time. Um, but and and the other thing is, is that I also was pretty I wanted to keep to food. I did include iron brew and I was thinking that whiskey was going to come up because I included a drink. Um, <laughs> but that, that's pretty much for time. I actually had in a, in a different version of this, a whole timeline of what is occurring with, with whiskey. Cause again, that's a hugely important money-making venture, particularly for Scotland and continues to be, I mean, much of, um, a lot of money comes in from whiskey production. Um, yeah, some people here consider it a food. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I would, you know, that, that's fair enough. I don't know about the, um, the nutritional <laughs> value, but. I knew, uh, I knew you'd have an answer. I just, just for fun, thanks. And tobacco, you're absolutely right. Tobacco, I mean, you can't, you can't talk about the slave trade and sugar without talking about tobacco as well. And the importance of snuff in particular, particularly for, you know, polite sociable societies. And, you know, you're not going to have um, a convivial uh, situation, particularly with men in the 18th century without snuff, right? Um, again, that's going to be something that's associated with the Americas and the tobacco plantations. You're not going to have a lot of tobacco grown in Scotland. Um, it's going to be, you know, if you're looking at it, a lot of this is going to say you're going to get symbols and you can see the things. It's going to be the, the best Virginia tobacco is going to be imported to Scotland. And so that transatlantic trade is going to be really important. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, uh, this is empire, right? A lot of it is empire. Empire is going to have a huge influence in the way people present themselves. And remember in the 18th, 19th centuries, being British meant being the best empire, right? That was part of what you are. Um, and so having those symbols of empire is pretty important. But yeah, I love. I, I knew somebody was going to ask about whiskey. I was surprised it didn't come up earlier. Right. What about um, the people from the township? It's no. One. The I think they're all crooks, okay. including Burr. They do nothing. I wouldn't say to get any. Sorry. <laughs> um, we do have a comment from David in the chat. Germans call beer liquid bread. Yes, they do. <laughs> to be fair, there's yeast and there's often wheat, particularly in, in German beers. So it makes sense. We're just about to reach um, our time, time up period. Any other discussion for Sarah today? Yeah, Mike had a quick question. How often do the Scots eat during the day? When? Well, what I period? mean, do they eat three times a day like we do now or back, you know, 200 years ago? How often do they actually eat? Um, well, I mean, it depends on the community. It depends on where, where you're looking and what time period. I mean, today you're going to have um, three meals um, mm -hmm. pretty clearly. Um, in the industrial period, you're going to see various changes in the diet. A lot of times before then, in as in most places, the biggest meal of the day is going to be the middle of the day, rather than the large dinner that we associate with with today's food. But that's going to change mm -hmm. with industrialization because again, you're working during mm -hmm. that hour. Um, and farming communities are going to have different food strategies than those um, in in non farming communities. Um, and also it depends on the time of year and when, when food's gonna be available. So that mm -hmm. changes throughout history and where you are in Scotland. Um, but again, I think with globalization, this concept of the three meals a day has become pretty, pretty standard.
And then, of course, there's the irony of calling your supper your tea, right? And it fits into your theme. So, And pudding being, you know, your something dessert. very different from jello pudding. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, if it... If it has any meaning, I have a friend who's testing his blood pressure. And on the sheet that came from the National Health System, you must record your blood pressure at breakfast, lunch, tea, and dinner. Mm -hmm. Yep, our 11 Zs. 11 Zs, yeah. 11 Zs, and my, my in-laws always talk about 11 Zs, right around 11, you have tea and you have cake. <laughs> Which points to four meals a day, but yeah, <laughs> depends on what you're saying as a meal. Oh, five, yeah, five breakfast, eleven Z's, lunch, tea, and dinner. And again, it depends on where you are and what you have access to and what your job, you know. Um, but the difference in supper, or tea, or dinner, or yeah. Well, I think we're we're out of time, but this has just been wonderful, Dr. Janek. I, I we really are delighted to have you with us today, and thank you for making the time for us. And nice. um, we're planning to invite Dr. Janek back sometime next year to talk to us about the history of St. Andrew's Societies in America, which she wrote her PhD on, and so that should be pretty fascinating as well. So. You can all look forward to seeing her again. And I think I'll, I'll go ahead and close the forum today. Cannot thank all of you enough for being here. Without you, we couldn't attract such interesting speakers. And so I, I thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for helping to keep the Scottish culture alive in the world. So and thank you for inviting me. This is fun. You're so welcome. So see you next month, everyone. And until then, yeah. be safe. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Connie. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.